started with some announcements. Um, I don't think a lot has happened in town the last week. <laughs> so, yes, but we've all had a happy New Year. Yes, yes. Uh, this is the fir our first meeting of the uh, of the new year. So far, so good. Um, and we'll be gearing up uh, the building committees on our uh, projects. So uh, we'll be gearing up in the coming weeks um, <clears throat> and uh, building up towards the release of the budget in mid-February. And then we'll have the budget season and then town meeting season. So, go so fast. Right. Um, any announcements? Uh? No, yeah. it's been quiet for the last two weeks, and I'm yeah. happy to report I have no more, have no more laryngitis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least I can say something. The Kent Street Senior Affordable Housing Committee will meet tomorrow evening at 6.30 in the <coughs> Denny Room, which is, I think, in the basement of the Health Department building across the street. Garden level. <laughs> Garden <laughs> level. <laughs> and uh, I um, announced something publicly that I've been saying privately, uh, and it's kind of out there. Um, but uh, my, my term is uh, coming, uh, coming to an end on the select board, and I've been faced with the uh, decision, do I or don't I run again, and I've decided that I will not be running again. So there will be an opening on, on the board of, uh, on the select board uh, come this May. And I wanted to get the word out there officially early so that uh, folks who might consider running have uh, time, because it, it does take time, and it's a big commitment to put together uh, a campaign. Um, and uh, Very rewarding. Yes, it's, it's, it's rewarding. It has its ups and its downs. Uh, I, I, this is my uh, sixth year on the board. I, I don't regret it at all. I've enjoyed it. Um, uh, there have been some tough moments. You know, I, th I think about uh, all the issues that we've been looking at in the last six years. Um, I'm now the senior person on, on the board, I guess. Uh, uh, and it's been, for me personally, I've, I've been involved in town government now for 19 years. Uh, I, I joined the advisory committee back in January 2000, so uh, it's been quite a uh, it's been quite a ride, and uh, 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 and and I, I think the town, in in many respects, is in in a, in a very good place, but we have a lot of challenges uh, ahead of us, um, most notably. Uh, our school projects, and we're committed now to uh, uh, what th three additional uh, school projects. So uh, that's quite a uh, plus the high school. Plus the high school that's ongoing. We're finishing up uh, the Coolidge Corner School, thank goodness, and uh, that's I think everyone kind of agrees that it's uh, come out really well. That's a successful uh, project. So it's my hope that. Uh, the other projects will be just as uh, successful, and uh, I, this board, I think, is in good hands, and I hope uh, we'll have uh, a bunch of people stepping up, uh, though I haven't seen a clamoring, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyone who wishes, who's thinking about it, I'll be happy to talk to them and, and encourage them to uh, to run. It's... it's uh, it's been, I think, for, for me personally, it's been kind of the honor of my life to, to be on this board. And Aww. it's, uh, so, well, anyway. We're going to miss you, Neil. Yes, right. very. But you've got me for another uh, 16 minutes. <laughs> 16 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Who's counting? <laughs> right. Okay. So we have some uh, folks signed up for public comment. Mr. Warren. Oh no. <laughs> First, Happy New Year. Is the microphone on? It is on. 
So uh, first, Happy New Year. And Neil, uh, thank you for your service. Sure. It's a long time. Um, <laughs> and I know that you've always been, I haven't been involved uh, in town politics for very long, but you've been very fair and open-minded, so I do thank you for that. And uh, I don't know, hopefully you'll go fishing or something. And, nah, uh, no, I'm not going I, anywhere. Not <laughs> So I will start. Uh, hello, my name is Paul Warren. I live at 71 Carlton Street. And the purpose of my presence before you is to request that you do not enter into a host community agreement with Ascend at 1032 Beacon Street for the following reasons. First, there is overwhelming opposition to this site. I have another stack, one of these for each of you. At a prior select board meeting, I delivered to you 707 signed opposition letters. Today, I brought along an additional 517 letters. That's a total of 1,224. And I know I have more in my inbox. I didn't get a chance to print them out. These opposition letters are from individuals and families who reside in condos, apartments, and single family homes. They also include letters from business owners, operators, and employees. Many come from town meeting members. The common theme in these letters is that a marijuana store within St. Mary's is not feasible. Second, you may have heard that uh, Ascend has plans to subdivide the 1032 property. Subdividing the property would put Whole Foods at risk as you know from Chris Soros' letter dated December 18, Whole Foods is grandfathered in at its current location based on the site's original status as a grocery store. Absent that grandfathering, Whole Foods would be required to have more than 30 parking spaces, which is clearly impossible. There are valid concerns that a subdivision forced by Ascend and the landlord would create two lots, each of which would need to conform to current zoning and may invalidate the Whole Foods lease. A decision to subdivide the property by Ascend and the landlord could result in Whole Foods leaving the neighborhood. Trading a grocery store for a marijuana store would be a crisis for the community and a lousy public policy outcome. Third, subdividing the property invalidates Ascend's community outreach meeting. The Cannabis Control Commission requires that the community outreach meeting include information adequate to demonstrate that the location will be maintained securely. A SEND security plan presented at the community outreach meeting on October 25, 2018 was based on a 6,200 square foot facility that utilized multiple doors, the first floor for retail, and the basement for securing and storing product. A new, yet to, define, yet to be defined subdivided site would have a different configuration and a security plan necessitating a restart of the pre-application in a new state-required community outreach meeting. And finally, the CCC requires that the community members be permitted to ask questions and receive answers from company representatives on their proposed plan. If the site changes, then the plans change. The community must be allowed to ask questions of ascend at a new community outreach meeting should Ascend put a new site and a new plan forward. Fourth, as you know, the site is within 500 feet of the McKinley Middle School and it's unlawful. We have submitted the Brooks survey based on field measurements which comply with state standard and the CCC regulations, which conclusively shows that the distance between 1032 Beacon and the McKinley Middle School violates the buffer zone requirements. We are very confident that our survey will stand up to the scrutiny by town professionals and other governing bodies at both the local and the state level. I don't know if you've seen this recently on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, this is a, an advertisement um, for lease signs have shown up on Waxies. So my fifth thing I wanted to mention is that Ascend does not appear to have site control. Last week, a leasing broker put two large four lease signs up on 1032 Beacon Street. It's not clear 
based on a sense public information that they have a valid lease for 1032 Beacon Street. In their October 2nd letter, letter to Trevor Johnson, they say in writing, and I quote, the property has been leased by Ascend. But at the community meeting on October 25th, the landlord stood up and I quote, we have this on video and transcript, there is currently no finalized lease. We are working on it, she said. That was three weeks after Ascend's letter to Trevor saying that they had a signed lease. These points are so important that I feel a need to be quite direct with you. The community does not know what Ascend is proposing. The issues raised are so basic that you should not abdicate responsibility to the State Cannabis Control Commission for defining and establishing the actual Ascend proposal. That responsibility rise with it, lies with this select board, with each of you. It's your role as our elected officials to look out for the welfare of this town, its neighborhoods, and its residents. That is not the role of a new, overburdened state-level commission. Obviously, from the stack of 1,200 plus letters that we provided with you, a large number of thoughtful, well-informed people feel strongly that a retail marijuana store in St. Mary's just won't work. They would be very upset at the thought that fundamental issues were overlooked and not even addressed by the elected officials before moving forward with the host community agreement with the Senate. Okay. Okay, thank you. Is it okay if I approach and deliver my sure. letters? Mr. Campbell. Right, you're not delivering to each one of us. I'm going to put these here. There's the bundle for each of you. Oh, please. No. Okay. I, I don't want one. Where would you like me to put them? Okay. It's kind of a waste of paper. And, 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 and your, previ your previous pile had primarily out of town residents. I was not sure. Well, I counted them. Okay. Sure. Mr. Kimball? Your word against mine. It's actually not true. I have all my neighbor's statistics. I'll be happy to break out. Thank you. Print it to do it. I just have one exhibit. It's on one piece of paper. Okay. So. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, select board members, deputy town administrator, uh, thank you for letting me come up. I'm, I'm going to cover points for a variety of our groups, so I'll do it just myself for, for efficiency. And I'm here to give some more detail, not around the national things we're all learning together around retail marijuana, but about this specific ascend proposal. I really want to try to tie some things together because there are a series of inconsistencies, um, incomplete or flat out contradictions within what their proposal has been. And as you weigh what Paul has said in the framework, I think it's useful to have some facts. First, customer volume, as we know, is an incredibly important issue for a marijuana store that is in a very urban area, so close to 12 million visitors and so many people that work and live there. At the first community meeting, Ascend was asked, will there be 10,000 or more visitors a year? And this is an exact quote. It won't be. No, it wouldn't be 10,000 a year. That's a daily volume of 28 or fewer customers. Uh, there was a lot of questions around that number, given some of the early research we'd done. At the second meeting, just five days later, Ascend got up and showed this chart, which I will say, by the way, despite repeated requests from us, even to the town, this is the only piece of documentation around volume or transit that has been put forward, to my knowledge, on this entire project. Uh, this shows 210 customers a day, which is up substantially from 28. Um, but we know, and uh, we've shared the data with a number of people, that smaller stores in similar urban areas do 1,500 to 2,000 customers a day, even four years after they've been opened. So a 210 number is itself implausible, uh, just impossible. What we dug deeper, we looked through every piece of documentation that Ascend has put anywhere to any municipality in Massachusetts, and we found in Cambridge uh, they had a traffic study done. They first started out by correctly citing the Institute for Traffic Engineers. They claimed they did the calculation, but then without showing the number, they put in their report, and I will quote, 
resulted in excessive estimates. So they disregarded the Institute for Traffic Transportation Engineer number and posited that there would instead be 67 customers a day at the 5,300 square foot marijuana store in Cambridge. 67 a day. Rural Leicester is getting 1,000 to 1,200 a day. Urban stores in Seattle and Denver get, as we noted, 1,500 to 2,000. So the actual number, when I reverse engineered as best we could, uh, the correct number should have been about 1,500 using the ITE calculations. These levels of just gross distortion from reality are very concerning. There's another thing that's concerning here, which we've asked, and I've sent several emails to the law firm of Ascend to provide this. Ascend anticipates that 70% of the transit will be foot or MBTA. Ask someone that uses my charting card all the time and lives within a block of two T-stops. I'd love that. Not only is there no source, uh, we've read everything you can find on Ascend in the public domain, and we think we know where that came from. Again, in page three of Appendix A of Submission 80. 82 dash something in Cambridge, we found the site. It's a 2016 study done of a restaurant in Harvard Square. And that's where they got the transit mode data. Not Brookline, not the MBT, not the Green Line, not a retail marijuana store, a restaurant from two years ago. That gives us a lot of concern. There's not a credible estimate of volume. There's not a credible beginning of a transportation analysis. I actually would say something even further, which is given the very high customer volumes of retail marijuana and the almost cavalier, almost irresponsibly casual assertion people make about the tea will just carry it, I think that responsible siting, any place there's public transit involved, there should be a transportation study done to the state level MassDOT standards, which provides the town or the city and the municipality with proper comfort. Third, on the issue of the actual site, as Paul pointed out, uh, Ascend was unambiguous in October 2nd letter. They signed the lease. When they were pressed a number of times at the first community meeting, immediately the landlord got up and said there is no lease. There is no credible position as to exactly who controls that site. Fourth, in that same October 2nd letter to Trevor Johnson, they describe and show plans for a full 6,200 square foot facility, but add in one sentence, and I quote, any floor area in excess of the town's 5,000 square foot limitation will be excluded from the store operations upon discussions to follow. Well, there was a discussion that followed. At that first community meeting three weeks ago, these were the very first two sentences of the sense formal presentation. And yes, I, I quote, why did we pick this site? Why do we like this site? First of all, the size of the facility, it is 6,200 square feet, close quote. That's how they opened their presentation to 145 people. In fact, of the total 25 minutes and two seconds of the formal presentation, 16 minutes and 20 seconds were devoted to exactly how they would use the entire former waxy site. There were hand gestures to doors, to sally ports, to new walls, to rear entrances for the product coming in, to the vault. You can see all that on the videotape. So fully 65% of the way they presented themselves to the community was how they used this exact building, how they fit out every square foot, how they used every single corner of that, that building. That was the core presentation. Fifth, in that same letter to Trevor Johnson, and in their October 9th PowerPoint provided to the town, and in all three of the community meetings, they kept saying that Ascend was a single vertically integrated company that comprised cultivation, manufacturing, security, and retail. In fact, if you look at Secretary of State Galvin's website and go through, there are at least 13 separate limited liability corporations that are involved in the Ascend. The Apple facility is actually controlled by Mass Grow, which is connected somehow to an LLC called Ascend Athol Reed. There is no known operating connection between those two, uh, between Mass, Ascend Mass, and the growing facility. It's unclear where their two contract security firms are reported, which LLC controls them. Before you make any decision, you need some clarity over which entity you're actually dealing with. And finally, and, okay, so, finally. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on the 500-foot buffer, Paul talked about our survey, but I'll make one other point. To respond to our survey, they first had the Brooks, they first had their Hayes survey just restamped. They didn't do a survey. Second, it turns out that the other survey that was submitted was done originally. The field work was done on August 22nd. At all three community meetings, when we challenged the survey, that survey was never brought forward. 
finally, when it was put forward, they didn't resurvey. They didn't refer to the actual deed of the McKinley School. They simply stamped a survey that was been in, done three months earlier. Ta not taking the care to look at the deeds as presented by us, as presented to the town, suggests a certain lack of care, a certain carelessness around an issue as important as the school buffer. So where I'll wrap up is just to say this. There are serious problems and inconsistencies here. Separate from what you believe may be a policy decision about what is appropriately early on in the town, at the State Cannabis Control Commission, and when it comes back down to the town, you all first, as a select board, as a deputy town administrator, as a town administrator, need a starting point. That's the basis. So what we're here to say is that you first need to, as Paul said, the reasons why not to do a host community agreement, but even before you start it, you first need to get a stable, committed proposal. And that would be something in writing in the public domain. Thank you very okay, much. Thank you. I'll just say one thing publicly. Um, uh, Ascend has, has been given the opportunity to respond to the survey. Um, and we haven't yet heard the response. Yeah. So. I was just disappointed they didn't take the deed from McKinley. And the well, company, OK. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We have one more uh, person signed up for public comment. Kate Coleman. Yeah. Actually, uh, yeah, come on up. Um, this is an issue that's on our agenda. Um, but, okay. What? what would you rather do, Neil? Um, well, let's hear it now. And, uh, okay. <clears throat> I'm here tonight before all of you to respectfully request that you vote not to, or let me put it in a positive way, that you vote to postpone uh, <clears throat> the vote to authorize the town of Brookline to put, purchase the Oak Street townhouses. And <clears throat> those are the, the townhouses, as you know, that are adjacent to the proposed new Baldwin School site. <clears throat> to, propose, to postpone that decision until the town of Brookline can fully evaluate the possibility of purchasing the new Newbury College facilities and land, so I'll refer to that in, the, in my presentation as the Newbury campus on Fisher Hill as an alternative to raising and building, raising the old or the current Baldwin School and building a new Baldwin School and purchasing these ab abutting properties. The Newberry campus <clears throat> would provide an immediate space for additional students to the school system and for displaced students as well from the renovation and new construction projects in the pipeline at the Pierce Driscoll Devotion uh, K-8 through schools as well as the Brookline High School over time. If the Newberry College campus, 7.9 acres, were purchased for $39 million, then the town would not need to purchase the abutting properties, 0.2 acres, for $4.7 million, uh, 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 or to raise the current Baldwin School and construct the proposed new Baldwin School for $100 million. Now, what brought me into this issue, I'm a <clears throat> retired surgeon from Mass General. I'm a Brookline resident for 40-some years. I raised my children here. They're now adults. One of them lives here, but I have no grandchildren in the school system. I don't have an immediate, direct reason why I would come to, I've come to three meetings now. Um, <clears throat> Four, actually, because I came to the special town meeting on this issue. But what brought me here is the safety issue. <clears throat> there are a lot of issues I care about. I care about this issue on a lot of fronts, but I came into it myself when I read about it from a safety issue. The new <clears throat> proposed <clears throat> Baldwin School is a mistake, I believe, because it is not in a location that would provide safety for the children who need to get to that school and for the children, teachers, staff, and parents during the school, school hours. Here's how I see it. <clears throat> I, know, I know the neighborhood well. Uh, 
I, I spend a lot of time in that particular area. And I don't believe, and I, I, I attended the hearing in this room where they showed, the architects showed the layout. And that new school, the way it is sited, where it has only one access street, which is Heath Street, if you've been there, and I'll bet you've all been there because it's an important decision for our town, it, the only other street that abuts it is really a way. It's almost like an alley. It's the Oak Street. It only has two structures on it. One of them is comprised of a three-unit um, <clears throat> set of townhouses, and then adjacent to it is, is an entrance for parking for a, one other house that fronts right on Heath Street. And then the other side of the street is, is the old Baldwin School. If you think about, and, and m mind you, the, the Heath Street is an old carriage lane. So it's only two lanes. There's the sidewalk space on both sides is very limited. And, and um, it's not always wide enough to put in sidewalks along there. But and so the, then the next abutting street that we deal with is a major thoroughfare. It's going to be, it's not abutting per se, but it's just immediately um, next to the school almost, and that's going to be Hammond Street. And the other major street that's near, near there, they're all within less than an eighth of a mile. They're a matter of a couple of blocks, two blocks, one block, two blocks. Uh, Route 9 is two blocks away. He, Hammond Street is one block away. And that, <clears throat> and those, we're dealing with a state highway, Route 9, where people are, it's a posted 40 mile limit, but people can go faster than that, and they do. We all do, any, any one of us. And then uh, that's become six lane, uh, uh, three lanes in each direction uh, um, on Route 9. And then the four lane Hammond Street, that, that intersection. So what happens is it's very congested, and, and there's a barbell effect. There's right. the rotary that um, is at one end, uh, just, a, just, just about a half mile down the road on Hammond, and then we have the Route 9 intersection there. So it's very congested. Now, if I, 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 I want to stay very personal. Don't, don't, I'm about to wrap this up. But, okay. you know, we had a fire at my house in Brookline, so the safety issue is a real issue to me. Not only <clears throat> do I think that the children are not going to be safe both, walk I don't think they will be safe walking to school, crossing those major thoroughfares, get it, and they certainly can't be riding bikes there. There's no way there could be bike lanes, and probably very difficult to have sidewalks. And difficult for those children to exit their cars and buses to, and to, get, to get in uh, to the school. The, the, the line of cars that will be waiting, only 37 cars can be in that loop at any given time to go around that school, will back up Heath School. Now, let me just... Please conclude. Let me, let me just say to you that... Um, we've been through... Uh, we've been to a lot of meetings on this, including town meeting, where two-thirds vote. I know. Just hold, hold off for one second. Yeah. You've heard a lot of this. Let, let me say, too, that I do not believe that first responders can get into that property. They can't turn on Heath Street. When, it, when there's a fire, they're going to get in multiple trucks, and they're going to need to turn them. There's no place for them to turn there. There'll be traffic trying to get kids in and out of that school. And there'll be usual traffic on the and other And we street. will have our fire chief approve all our plans. So we're going to have the experts looking at this. Well, you can, you so can, you can, you can. We've through all this. Fine. You, I, I don't agree with that. Okay. But let me, let me say that all we need is to have an emergency at that hospital and try to get the ambulances in, the fire trucks, the police trucks. If you, I think we really, I think it's really imperative that you think very concretely mm -hmm. about this. The <clears throat> Van Ness original traffic study designated this proposed site as a Category 4 or least favorable site for a school. Okay. 
I believe that what Please conclude. I am. I believe that I'm saying that the last three minutes. Well, let me Please say, conclude. Let me say a conclu conclusion here in one sentence. I, I respectfully ask you to postpone that decision. We don't even know if we're going to build that school. And if we hold on making a decision about bu buying this property, these properties, and take the time to vet the site for Newberry College, we could then make a ra okay. rational decision about this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'll just acknowledge uh, the receipt of a number of emails with the, with the same uh, uh, same sentiment. And for the record, I don't know if I gave you my name, but it's Kathleen Thurman. Uh, okay. And I live in uh, Bethlehem, Ohio. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
as dictated by it, uh, like I said, to close at the end of the month. So we're, we're obligated to move forward given that the three conditions have been met. Yes, and there, right. uh, yes, I, I believe that uh, there's uh, nothing, nothing that would, that would suggest that we, um, we could step away from the transaction at this point. Right. Um, let me just state something. In the theme in many of the correspondence that we've gotten, and we also just heard, is uh, uh, we should be looking at uh, Newberry College. And uh, we, uh, a bunch of us have uh, been up there and looked around. Uh, we've had the tour. Um, I, I, I will say that, number one, uh, wi winding down a college is not, an, is not an easy thing, and it's not going to happen uh, quickly. Um, and, and, and this is a, a process that uh, Newberry is going to be going through. The town is not the only interested party. This involvement uh, from uh, the uh, Attorney General's office, uh, the, the uh, uh, Public Charities Division, and it's uh, quite uh, quite complex. Um, two, uh, I've, I've heard it said that uh, there's a notion that uh, the town, if the town were to just buy the property, we could just move in and and, and put a school up there. Uh, that, that is not the case. Um, you know, the buildings are set up uh, for, for college, which is a very different kind of uh, setup than for an elementary school. So it'd be, they'd have to be very significant uh, changes. So it's, it's, it's not quick, it's not easy, uh, it's complicated, um, and you know, the town will monitor it. The town is going to study it, um, but it, we're going to study it for uh, a broad range of uh, of potential uses, and also, um, even if the town weren't to buy it, the town is an interested party as uh, the regulator of land use. So, uh, um, it, it's you know, and we also have to be concerned about the, uh, the students uh, who are being displaced, and a lot of people are losing jobs. So we have to be very concerned about uh, about that. So. Uh, we're we're looking at it, but uh, it, it, the, the notion that it's a uh, quick and easy uh, solution to our uh, problems, the the eureka moment, uh, I don't think uh, we haven't found the eureka moment. Um, could you refresh my recollection? I believe at the la our last meeting, um, you said that there was no no building on that site that actually was sufficiently sized for an elementary school. That, that is correct. correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the buildings on this site are old, going back uh, to the last century, if not the previous century. Some of um, them. Yeah. Some of them. And uh, we got a very, very clear message that um, uh, the um, school, schools that we put our kids in should be fossil fuel free and to make any of those buildings comply with that requirement would be a huge expenditure, very risky because we don't know the environmental condition of the property, um, and uh, you know, no nowhere near as uh, viable a an option for us as the Baldwin, Driscoll, and Pierce project. So. Um, any questions for uh, Mr. Simpson? So we, we don't have uh, anything to approve tonight, but the uh, process is moving forward. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a select board personnel item. Ms. Goff? Good evening. Yes, um, we have an upcoming vacancy in our office for the administrative assistant whose uh, focus is licensing. Okay. So we're looking for uh, approval to uh, advertise and fill the position. Okay, this is a key position in the select board office, so hopefully we'll find a uh, qualified person real soon. Okay, um, any questions, comments from the board? Uh, all those in favor of uh, authorizing the filling of the administrative assistance licensing vacancy in the select board office, please say aye, select person Franco, aye. select person Heller, aye. select person Green, aye. select person Hamilton, aye. and the chair votes aye. Thank you. 
And we have a receptionist senior clerk vacancy in the Recreation Department. Ms. Jackson. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. My name is Lee Jackson. I'm the Acting Director of Recreation, and I'm here tonight to request an authorization to hire for our senior clerk at the pool. Um, we've had a recent retirement of Caroline Fusco, and she was with us for some 20 years or more, I believe, and um, she's been phenomenal, but she has recently retired. Her last day with us will be the 21st of January, and we are looking to fill that position at the front desk. It's a critical role for us. It will be handling a lot of administrative tasks, customer service, and training. Okay. The last day will probably be 18th. Perhaps I, perhaps I messed that up. Yeah. Thank you for the right. correction. Okay. Any uh, comments, questions? And I'll move that we fill the vacancy, authorize the filling of the vacancy of the receptionist senior clerk vacancy in the recreation department. All those in favor, please say aye. Select person Franco. Aye. Select person Heller. Aye. Select person Green. Aye. Select person Hamilton. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank, Thank you. you. Please convey our best wishes to her. I will. I will do so. Thank you. She's been here for so many years. Yes. Okay. So now um, we had a presentation. Um, few weeks ago, I guess, at this point, uh, about the potential for a pilot program for electric scooters. Um, I was in Washington, D.C. Uh, a few weeks ago and noticed that these scooters are everywhere. Uh, they've really taken over the nation's uh, capital. Um, and I saw a lot of uh, people uh, riding around on them. Um, uh, though I, 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 I don't recall where they were riding, whether the sidewalks or, or in the street. That's actually probably something we can talk about. Um, uh, but uh, w w what I did see is uh, the scooters, th th they were generally, they, they, you know, w one of my fears in just thinking about this, is a rider will uh, ride the scooter and then just there aren't docking stations, so they would just drop it in the middle of the sidewalk and people start tripping over it. Um, and they block the public sidewalk. And uh, I, I, di I didn't see that. In, in I've seen that with bicycles. I, don't, I haven't right. seen it with scooters. And that concerns me. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that is a concern. But um, So I'll turn it over to Ms. Hamilton, who's kind of our point person on this, to kind of describe what's going on. And, and then we can... Uh, hear from folks, anyone who wishes to comment on this. Yeah. So I've been working on this issue um, actually for, gosh, a couple months now, um, primarily with Todd Crane, our Director of Transportation, who's really done the heavy lifting, um, and I've really enjoyed working with him a lot. Uh, and we both have participated uh, on behalf of the town of Brookline on the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. They commissioned what was done originally for Hubway, um, now Blue Bikes, bringing in a couple of communities to talk about what would we want for regulation. And so um, Todd had really done a lot of work this past summer to, to try to figure out what, did, what were the lessons that we learned through the Hubway experience, what did we want to avoid, um, and I think he and I were both in agreement that we wanted to go with a permitting scheme as opposed to um, a sole source contract um, because of the limitations that we've encountered ever since executing that. So um, the, the state still hasn't quite caught up with um, how to treat these um, scooters. We've heard from MassDOT and we've heard from other um, state agencies that What's currently on the books to enforce don't really apply to these, um, but there's still a gray area. So they're leaving room for the municipality to do a pilot and collect information. That's really what we want to get out of this pilot agreement. Um, I've talked to my counterparts in other municipalities across the country. Portland, Oregon was uh, one of the first to do a pilot, um, and they collected a lot of information through a, sur a user survey, and they started to see trends um, that can benefit the rest of us. I definitely understand some of the concerns about parking, um, 
obstructions in the public right of way and how we treat those. Um, one of the things that I was the most impressed with when I was learning about this technology, and I actually got to use it when I was in Tel Aviv about two weeks ago, they have really kind of taken over the bike lanes. Every other um, uh, two-wheeled device in the bike lane was actually a, an electric scooter. Um, and I didn't see any electric scooters, you know, on the ground obstructing um, the right-of-way. But what... Um, what I've heard from most people is that their concern is that they won't be utilized, that they'll um, obstruct. And so we built into our pilot agreement, one, that they are taken off the street every single night. Um, I, too, have seen the uh, shared bicycles. Now, one of the things that I will stress is since we are a hubway community, we actually prohibit dockless bikes from really using um, or being used in our municipality. So when they are driven here or ridden here, then they're parked, and sometimes it takes days for that company to collect them. We don't actually have any agreement with those companies. The agreement exists with the neighboring municipality. So we have no enforcement mechanism. So in this pilot agreement, we actually built in language that one would have them taken off of our streets every single night, would also allow our DPW director to prevent them from being deployed if there's inclement weather. And then two, it uh, requires the companies to lock these devices when they enter into municipalities that don't have an agreement. And they need to be collected within four hours. So all of these things have enforcement uh, mechanisms where the scooters are seized if that is not uh, complied with. So I welcome, you know, more feedback, but uh, <coughs> this has been a pretty collaborative process. So if, for example, uh, if Boston hasn't signed on, mm -hmm. and um, so we're, let's say Bird or Lime, those two of the companies decide they want to set up a pilot. So somebody rides it into Boston, they cross the city line, boom, the thing's going to lock up? No. So what it what happens is you can't request that for a new ride. So you can uh, finish out your ride, but it disappears off of the app. Uh, so so it, doesn't, it doesn't appear. So there's a disincentive to the uh, company for, for bikes to go off their grid. Yeah. And the light turns red, and it... You can still, I guess, use it as a non-electric scooter, but the the device doesn't allow you to get up past, you know, whatever you can pedal. And there are there are GPS um, units within these, so I mean that's how they know where they are to collect them every night. Would they be able to? Um, so I'm assuming we're prohibiting these on sidewalks. Yes. So would the company be able to tell by the GPS if somebody was on the sidewalk and they could lock it up? Or no. I, I don't think GPS is that accurate. Okay. So then if somebody is on the sidewalk, um, who bears the responsibility? Um, can we insist that the company uh, be charged and they can pass that on to the consumer rather than our having to, you know, if, if the person is getting a ticket or whatever, it's basically, my concern is, is that it'll be difficult to, inf A, it'll be difficult to enforce, mm -hmm. and um, so, a and I'm concerned about people, pedestrians on the sidewalk, and, you know, whether this will be harm to them, especially people who have disabilities and who are trying to negotiate the sidewalk. Um, so... You know, I'd like to see the town, and one of the ways it seems to me to deal with this is that the the bike itself gets the ticket and the, t and the company has to bear the responsibility of that and can pass it on to their, their, the rider or whoever it was. But we don't have to take the person to court or do with that, you know. <laughs> 
whatever uh, we have yeah, to do. Yeah, I think you're getting into I, legal issues. Though. Yeah, and from my familiarity, well, it, it's, it's the on the user. So the enforcement really is the police department to pull the person over, and it would be treated like a bicycle. I have a couple of mm -hmm. concerns. And you're adding another hazard to the road. Um, the, the, the fact that they're in the bike lane sort of scares me. Bikes, at least the ones I see on Beacon Street, are coming down to see the faster cars. And these scooters uh, are not very fast. So there's this conflict between bikers and scooters in the bike lane. Secondly, uh, the scooters are not as visible to a car that may be turning as the scooter is scooting across the street. Um, so it seems to me that you know, it, it, during this um, this trial, we have to you know, figure out how we can mitigate those significant dangers of allowing scooters on, on, our, um, on our streets. And you know, I, I haven't seen anything where you know, that that issue is. I don't know if well, that's unique. So two two things. Well, I mean One, it's just an added yeah. hazard. Yeah, but bicycling infrastructure has greatly improved in the last couple of years. Not with bicyclers. <laughs> <laughs> well, the infrastructure to uh, mitigate, I guess, especially turning traffic. Um, in Boston, you'll see a lot uh, more um, parked cars protecting a bike lane, and now there are separated uh, signalization. What comes to mind is the BU Bridge now. I think they did a fantastic job um, to protect the bike lane from uh, turning right traffic. That used to be a nightmare. Um, and as someone who used to bike a lot, um, most bicyclists average between 12 and 17 miles per hour. Uh, to get above 17 miles per hour, yeah, you'd have to be going downhill to get that assist. Um, these top, these electric scooters top out at 15 miles per hour. When I was using them in Tel Aviv, I was keeping up with bicyclists. I didn't find them zipping past me so much. Uh, most commuters are going about 12, 13 miles per hour. You would really need a, a long downhill stretch to get above 15 miles per hour. So I don't, I didn't see a conflict. I actually saw um, that they they were going just as fast or as slow as the other bicyclists using the bike lane. Yeah, but we don't know how that's going to work here in the U.S. of A. Mm -hmm. um, well, we do from other pilot programs being uh, across the, the country. Portland, Oregon, d I asked them directly if they have had any um, major issues. Um, I asked uh, San Diego, um, Denver, and a lot of these places have better bicycling infrastructure than we do, but I think that we'll get there. But but isn't that the result also of better uh, better street layouts? Uh, the and newer you know, what? Newer cities. In the newer cities, you know, I mean, I think we we are at a disadvantage because we're older. Yeah, but our the way that we're resurfacing and the way that we're redoing our roadways, you know, as they come up will allow us to address a lot of those issues. Engineering is a marvel. Peter will agree with that, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I've, I've got a, a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. I, who's, who's picking up these scooters? I, I see in the draft agreement that they can only be used between, I think, 9 o'clock at night and, uh, or excuse me, between uh, 5 o'clock in the morning and 9 o'clock at night. So what happens to them? 5 a.m.? I thought it was five, but I thought it was oh six a.m. Okay, six a.m. to nine p.m. Okay. So, from what I understand from uh, the companies, they have uh, people contractors that are paid per scooter that they collect off of the street and charge in their either private residence or you know whatever location they have control over. So it's mostly third parties. I believe. And I know we don't know what companies would participate in the pilot program, but we're reasonably confident that they have the sufficient contractors to go out and collect these scooters to make sure that they're um, fully charged and uh, stored where they're supposed to be. From my understanding, at least two of the bigger companies certainly have that um, uh, 
ability. Uh, we've seen that in just their operations in other cities. I think there are two other smaller companies that have expressed interest to Todd, mm -hmm. um, so we'll verify with them um, you know, that they have the infrastructure in place. And when is this pilot going to take place? I'm a, I'm a little bit confused. It's, are we talking about uh, a March pilot program beginning, or is this going to be something that starts in the spring? I assume by it, at this point, we're looking at the spring. We haven't had our first snowfall. Um, so so, the, so we're looking after the snow season? I would assume at this point that it will probably be in April 1st. Deal. Well, it can snow after April 1st. Well, I mean, <laughs> I personally would like to see how this plays <coughs> out with inclement weather. I think we would learn a great deal about how responsive the companies are mm -hmm. and whether or not that's some headache that we want to deal with. So do it under a pilot, and then at the end of the pilot, we figure out whether or not it's for us. So theoretically, there's a four-hour window. Mm -hmm. So somebody takes a scooter at noon, and they drop it at 2. And um, they don't put it in the right place. They just drop it in the middle of the sidewalk, like the Dockless spikes in Boston. I, I see that. Mm -hmm. And so the company has four hours to pick it up, right? Yeah. So what happens if it's in the middle of the sidewalk? Somebody in a wheelchair comes down and wants to go and can't get past it. What happens then? Someone can call the number that is listed on the scooter. Okay. So is it going to be in big letters or big <laughs> numbers so that a disabled person in a wheelchair can't, you know, exactly get up and go and examine the bike for the number? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. this is what I'm, I'm saying is that I'm concerned I am concerned about that issue because I have seen it in Boston in terms of bikes. Yes, uh, I guess we're going to have to see, you know. But I just want to make pilot, sure yeah. that that kind of stuff is built into this. And I don't, I'm not sure I there see it. There are penalties. I mean, just shy of calling the police and saying there's something blocking the, like, the sidewalk. Well, but I seem to remember we heard something about a requirement that mm -hmm. a photograph be taken. Right. In order to stop the ride, so. Well, when the ride is ended, you're supposed to take a photograph, which ends the ride. Okay. And it's a behavioral nudge, so that what Nancy is describing, you know, it, but something could blow over. I mean, it happens. Okay. I've got one yeah. other. It's not a question. It's sort of a request. I think. Um, I think there's some issues to be worked out here, but I'm reasonably confident that we can craft something that gives everybody some confidence that this is going to work. But I do think we need to prospectively lay out our requirements for a pilot program and say this is the sort of metric against we're going to against which we're going to judge success. Mm -hmm. um, and I think things like the number of rentals that we see is important to to sort of set out a, uh, a stake in the ground at the beginning. I think. Um, some metric against which we say um, the number of complaints that we receive should be less than this number. And if we receive this type of complaint, then we're very concerned. Yeah. Um, I'm also a little bit concerned about uh, sort of a, uh, having too many scooters on the street um, and we're sort of having too many scooters to we've overmatched demand that, that's saying that we've got and I'm going to make up numbers here, 500 scooters on the street, but there's only 75 people renting them, and there are all these scooters sort of sitting around that aren't being utilized with any regularity. So I think, I think we just need to be sort of um, very thoughtful about what is a requirement for a successful pilot program and the standard against which we're going to uh, assess relative success or mm -hmm. failure of this. So. My my personal goal is to see a utilization above like sixty or seventy percent, and so uh, Todd and I discussed you know how many scooters do we think we should start with. We're thinking about a hundred, which I actually think is very small. We're going to see a lot of demand. These companies are collecting a lot of daily, a lot of information on an hour by hour and daily basis that 
we've also put into the pilot agreement that they will share with us. So we will have access to this information and we built into the agreement that based on the utilization, we will s revisit the number of scooters that we're, al we're allowing to be permitted. At, at what point? Do they inform us? I believe it's by week. By week. Mm. Yeah. Do you also um, have um, the ability to reassess the entire program during the four month period? For yes. example, if, if, if um, we find that, I don't know, off the top of my head, uh, we have really big problems on Beacon Street. Um, you know, after two weeks, we, we see that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have the ability to intervene then and, and make some adjustments? Yes, I think there's a clause in here that says at any time mm -hmm. the town of Brookline um, can tell them to pull the, the scooters. Yeah, I also want injury statistics to be a part of the metric okay. and we should make sure the police department is collecting the data in a way that um, involvement of scooters is explicitly noted and can be uh, queried in their database. Okay. Both accidents and complaints. Right, yeah. You know, I know that there's some concern among the senior community um, that they would not, many, many seniors wouldn't be able to use this device if it doesn't have a seat. Mm. So are these particular bikes going to have a seat in this pilot or how is no, no I don't think anybody what I understand there isn't a manufacturer yet that uh, is putting out seat? something with a seat although I think that that is about to change although um, if someone can't ride except on a seat they probably should be on a scooter well, yeah. that, that's a good point <laughs> but Todd assured me in writing that there's nothing in our pilot language that pr would prohibit that type of device mm -hmm. to fall within this structure. So it's just a matter of what is available ma like by a manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that demand will come. Okay. Um, this has been an interesting discussion for the board, uh, but we, sure. this is a... One other question. Uh, how, how do we regulate uh, Motor scooters. I mean, not those are licensed. Not spike, well, not uh, motorcycles. Mopeds. Yeah, mopeds yeah. Um, under certain engine size. They're not regulated. Yeah. Right. right. Forty nine cc's. They're not really regulated. Mm -hmm. But over fifty cc's, you need a motorcycle license, and they are treated exactly like uh, a, a motor vehicle, a motorcycle. I, I guess my question is, uh, for under fifty cc's, are we sort of opening the door to expansion of that? They, from what I know, because I, I actually own a, a moped um, that's over 50 cc's, and I do have a motorcycle license, um, but ones under 50 cc's are not really road worthy, so you could be are pulled these over. Are road worthy? <laughs> <laughs> that's debatable. <laughs> I guess we're going to find it. <laughs> the hard way. <laughs> but under, under 50 cc's, the the police could pull you over because it's not registered. So is there an opportunity here? I mean, one of the things that, um, you know, I think a lot of us have talked about in the past is that um, a lot of these modes of transportation don't have any kind of license or license plate or, um, you know, insurance liability. I'm assuming that the company uh, uh, charges its, is that is that the great case? They're charging their company, their clients to pay for insurance in case they, they hurt anybody or they run into somebody? I know that's somebody? the case with Zipcar. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the um, customer relationship is between, you know, these companies and their, their clientele. I can tell you what's in the pilot agreement. There's indemnification for the town, and we require um, in hefty insurance on behalf of the, the companies. But but shouldn't we protect our, um, you know, I mean, these are going to be on the streets potentially affecting our residents. I would like to know that the company is mandating insurance 
that people who take these things out have some sort of insurance in case they are in an accident with somebody and, you know, damage them. I mean, in a car, if you damage somebody, you have medical insurance through, through the uh, auto insurance. So personal in liability yeah. insurance? Yeah. Is that a, is that a oh. standard thing? Well, I mean, the homeowner's insurance covers you. For I know, example, but on a bicycle, I mean, you'll have personal liability insurance. So I think, I think the pilot agreement does require yes. that the, the company require, yeah, carry insurance. So it's um, a minimum limit different. of a million dollars per occurrence and $3 million in the aggregate. Yeah. So, so that identifies us. No, we're insurance. named as an additional insurer. So the, the yeah. company so it itself has to have Right, it covers insurance. them and, and also we're the additional insurer. It doesn't refer to individual um, users. Individual I'm, con I'm concerned about Well, that's a question we should ask. Yeah, I mean. Well, and if we don't require it for bicyclists, then. Well, I think we should, but that's another question. Yeah, this, that's, this, a, this that's a high level policy yeah. question, not necessarily. But, for this but I think that, that this is a motorized vehicle in a way, and, you know, I think it's. I don't know. Sorry. I think we should, we should start to protect people who, pedestrians uh, who are in danger from these things, especially if a person is operating it in a way that's not anticipated, for instance, they're riding on the sidewalk or whatever. Well, sure. I'd like to hear from the public. So if there's anyone who wishes, if there's anyone who wishes to comment on this, Mr. Madison and then Ms. Frawley. Uh, hello, uh, Hugh Madison, town meeting member, Precinct 5. Um, I first rode, it, rode a, a scooter last summer in Portland, just, just a couple of blocks. And then uh, I was, when the town had a couple of demonstrations at the, uh, at the farmer's market and at the uh, Corey Hill Day. So I, I was up involved in that. Um, first of all, I think, I think these are going to become very popular. And that's, that's the whole reason for the pilot program is to test out what the, what the problems are. Um, the train, etiquette, etiquette is, and courtesy, I think, are the watchwords because you can't, it's hard to legislate those. But um, part of that would be the training. Um, people, when they get on them right now, they go for a very minimal, minimal training, like a minute, maybe, but maybe two or three minutes would be more worthwhile. Um, and the training would talk about don't go on sidewalks, uh, um, don't swerve around pedestrians and scare them, and, you know, basically the common sense things. One, one, um, and, 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 and if there's an infraction that's reported, people have to give their credit card. Okay, well, the credit card, that, you know, to the company, it could be a surcharge. If you get reported, the surcharge could be pretty hefty. You know, if you leave it in the middle of the sidewalk or hit somebody, or, you know, it could be a, a, a series of surcharges that the, uh, the company would be authorized to charge the, the user. So that would be one way of, uh, of uh, controlling it. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking maybe uh, uh, little training, training sessions in, in parks or in private areas, um, not, not in, in the traffic. Older people, in, in terms of uh, uh, a scooter with a seat, um, um, Razor, R-A-Z-O-R, makes, makes one. Um, I, I haven't seen one. I think, I think I saw a picture of one on Harvard Street um, that Frank Carroll offered. Um, but they cost like three or four hundred, four or five hundred dollars. They're fairly cheap. And they have a, 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 a range of about 40 minutes. Um, when we were uh, at Corey Hill, my question was, can it go up the hill? I know it can go down, but can it go up? And they tested it. And yeah, it, it, it went up the hill and it, it went faster than a person can walk, which is good. Um, in fact, people said, gee, I'd like to have one at the bottom of the hill on a rainy day and I could ride up the hill and get up there quickly. So, I mean, that's the kind of situation that, that it might be useful for. Newbury College, a fellow from Newbury College said, and we have lots of students that want to go back and forth a lot, and uh, our shuttle doesn't run that often. So that's, a, that's another application. There are a lot of applications. My guess is that private ownership will become quite a, quite a deal, too, um, in which case all this is moot, except for the etiquette, you know, all the licensing <laughs> and everything. Um, 
in terms of uh, uh, proper manners, you have to be 16. You have to have a driver's license, and you have to be over 16. So, um, so we're not talking about eight-year-olds zipping around. They they have other scooters they can use for that, but uh, they use these skateboards. And you, you mentioned uh, bicycles. You know, bicycles have this Copenhagen wheel. I don't know if you've heard about it, but it, uh, it's a hub that, that mounts on a regular bicycle and has an electrical. It's it's charged and and and, and you can you can use an app with it and uh, uh, it it's, it assists you. So the, the the area between a bicycle and a scooter is getting very gray because that's a motorized, technically motorized bicycle, and yet you'd, you'd hardly ever know it because the the hub doesn't really you know you wouldn't really notice if it wasn't pointed out to you. So that's another issue. But I I think they're going to become very uh, very popular. Yeah, I have any a, questions? No, I, I have a geo orbital wheel that I that was demonstrated here at town hall. Yeah. So I went out and bought one, and uh, it, I can zip around town. And you have to look really hard to to see that it's an electric wheel, yeah. but it's very nice. We'll, we'll see you out and around then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Frawley. And Mr. Chair, I never raised my hand. You were reading my mind. <laughs> I saw you were uh, <laughs> inching your way to the microphone. Yeah, I have more concerns. I, I feel that uh, Select Person Heller brings up the issues I'm concerned about. And even the liability insurance, we'd have to look at the details in it to see. The Wall Street Journal is raising the issue of the investment of it because there's so much breakdowns, there's so much vandalism. And that's just across the country. You name some cities that you think are good, but the uh, internet shows that there's a half dozen major cities that are having big fights over these. And the vandalism is very significant. And the things break down very easily. But the vandalism is unbelievable. And, I mean, it's really challenges the imagination of how you can damage these these scooters. It's pretty vile. But one of the main things they do is they cover the ID on each scooter that the apps need to be able to communicate. So that's why they are also being abandoned wherever they are because people are vandalizing them, removing the electric connection, the technology, to be able to have the company find them later, for example. Um, so those are very serious concerns that I have, and apparently there are pilot, uh, San Francisco originally was going to do it as a real program. Now they back down because there's so much opposition. So they're doing it as a pilot program, 2,500 of them, 2,500 scooters in San Francisco this coming summer. I think we need to step back on this and do a little homework because one of the things with salesmanship is you tell us everything good about it, which common sense many of us can figure out, but you don't tell us the downside. And this is a startup kind of thing. Um, your two big companies, uh, Bird and Lime, are, are actually considering, at least Lime is uh, uh, being purchased by Uber, for example. So. The others are backing off from investments. We don't want to be caught with just for a few bucks in licensing fees to, and in a town and a city, Massachusetts, whose roads every winter in Brookline we need potholes fil filled. I worry about opening a door and having a 15 mile, mile, mile scooter coming, which a bicyclist is more easy to be slower riding along the city streets. Um, People who do a scooter are going to want to kind of keep a certain momentum going. Um, who's going to pay for that? Who's going to really be liable for that? It really does come down to enforcement. And where are our lawyers? In the, we should have town council on this. We should have the police in on this sitting here. Not necessarily having the answers right now, but listening to the, tw the questions and then come back with some more research. Understanding that this is such a new industry. It's less than two years old. There's so little feedback on it anywhere. Raw data, for good analysis, you need raw data, very little, and a lot of it's not good. So what, what little there is is not good. 
So I really would be concerned about this as being um, probably an idea who still needs t tweaking. Um, and I'm not sure what the tweaking is, but it needs something. And I don't want us to be the, the poster child for a failed experiment. So, and we are, as uh, Selectman Heller says, we are a very different configuration for our streets, for our public transportation, for the potholes that we are notorious for in this state in particular, as opposed to Vermont or New Hampshire that does a better job. We have to consider that. And it's not just the sidewalk, but if they're on the sidewalk, only the police can enforce something about that. Who's gonna be able to be, it's gonna be chaotic, just very chaotic. And I, I don't know if there are answers to that, but I'd like to see us ask those questions and see if we can get the answers to that. So I think that this shouldn't be um, thrown out, but this should not be voted on in an approved way yet. We have a lot to learn about them. And I would like to see the Board of Selectmen staff at the very least start looking. It took me five seconds to ask the Google, what are the problems with electric sco scooters? Boom, lots of articles came up. And whenever you make a major decision, a major investment, a major decision, and put your citizens at risk, including commuters who ride through the city, through our town in this case, you really have a responsibility to look at the ins and the outs and the minor details. And the details are often where both God and Satan are. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, David Trebet. Um I'm the chair of the Pedestrian Advisory Committee uh -huh. of the Transportation Board. And while we don't normally, our advice is normally given to the Transportation Board, we don't usually come to select board meetings, but Frank Carroll emailed me this afternoon about this. He had a well, we're glad you're here. <laughs> um, basically, I want to underscore the concerns that have already been raised. Our concern is pedestrian safety. Um, we did take up this issue of lecture scooters at our October meeting. Um, and following that meeting, we wrote to the Transportation Board and recommended that the town's rules and regulations be amended to prohibit the operation of electric scooters and electric bicycles on the sidewalk. So not on, you know, we are, again, very concerned about pedestrian safety and mainly I want to underscore that. I think enforcement is an incredible issue because enforcement away from the commercial centers largely doesn't happen. And so there is a, there will be issues of safety I don't know what the right approach in education and enforcement, a combination of all of the above is, but I basically want to sort of raise the alarm, as others have said, this is an issue, there will be accidents, let's try to get ahead of it. Thank, mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Mr. Davis? Thank you, I'm Jonathan Davis, <coughs> town meeting member, precinct 10. Uh, I noticed in the highlights of the draft pilot license agreement, uh, the second bullet point talks about uh, ensure helmet and I guess that's helmet rather than the German name Helmut. Uh, helmet and safe operations are communicated to users, especially you no know, riding on the sidewalk, proper parking locations with each ride activation. I, I must say, I. Maybe I missed it, but I didn't see it in uh, the requirement about with each ride at, uh, activation, uh, this kind of safety communications uh, in either the uh, agreement or in the uh, draft select board vote. So maybe I missed it. Uh, maybe it's there, but I, I didn't see it. Um, the second uh, point I wanted to make is um, I don't see, uh, and maybe there is one, but I, I didn't read anything about a protocol built into what's supposed to be a pilot program uh, to collect data on things like sidewalk riding and running red lights. I don't think it's sufficient uh, to rely on complaints because somebody is riding on the sidewalk you're not going to get you're not going to get a pedestrian to you know oh, I have to uh, I have to email uh, the Brookline online or oh, I have to call the 911. They're not going to do that. 
And I think that there has to be, or there, I, I personally think there ought to be a protocol involving town personnel, uh, maybe on some sort of a sampling basis, to collect data uh, that is not, in my view, is not going to be reported by either motorists or bicyclists or pedestrians about things like running red lights uh, and sidewalk riding. Uh, I, think, I think it's important to collect the data for, uh, for what might be the bad news. Uh, the third point I'd like to make is I wonder about the town's liability uh, to riders of these scooters who um, get thrown off, their, thrown off their scooters because they hit potholes in the streets that have not been repaired. Uh, and maybe they get thrown off their scooters and, you know, and get hit by a car. So I, I, I think that the uh, extent of uh, town liability for the, particularly the post-winter conditions of our roads uh, is something that probably should be looked at very, very seriously. Thank you. Thank you. The, on the issue of the helmets, um, in the, in the, in the post-pilot agreement, uh, Operation 6I, 6H is uh, scooters are forbidden from operating on the sidewalk or any other space reserved exclusively for pedestrians. And then I is company shall provide notice to all users by means of signage or through mobile app that uh, written on streets, uh, written, not written on sidewalks, uh, helmets are required. I wonder if that's enough. Yeah. Yeah, come, come, come to the mic so our vast TV audience can hear your important remarks. Now I'm going to make you nervous, Mr. Davis. Yes. Um, it's, I don't think, I don't, I don't see where it says that uh, this information uh, is with each activation. It's possible that it's in the mobile uh, or the web application on their website. The way, by the way, uh, Blue Bikes, uh, you have to look really hard in on their web pages to find to find anything about um, uh, 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 about riding uh, your blue bike following uh, in accordance with the traffic rules. Uh, so it's I'm I'm focusing on what was yeah. represented in terms of with each ride app. Uh, right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that's all well and good. And perhaps we can require it, but it would be. I would. Ex I would expect uh, that many, many people just. You, you. It's like with these uh, uh, user agreements on websites. You. You get all this legal mumbo jumbo, and you just. Scroll down. You, you scroll down. You press agree, and boom. Yeah, no, I, I, I get your point. But I, I think there's no cure-all. Um. I, I will say when I rented the scooter and signed up for the first time, there were a series of pages that were very graphic and said, you know, you must obey, um, you know, the current traffic laws and, um, you know, please stick to the, um, to the bike lanes. You know, and I did click through, but I did read it because it was very simple. It was very easy to understand, very easy to digest. That was the Israeli version? Maybe. So uh, we, let's hope the American version is uh, just as graphic. And I mean, while you're on the topic, one thing that concerns me is that on this page about the electric scooter share characteristics, the, the last word is that users must follow all applicable traffic laws. And um, one of the 
one of the ways we tre teach people about traffic laws in this country is to have them get a, a license to operate a motor vehicle. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there are, at least I don't know of any, um, classes for people who are going to be riding these things. I mean, you know, you have to take a test, you have to, you know, you take driver's ed, you, you, know, you do all this stuff. I'm wondering whether that's necessary here. One of the things that that people complain about in terms of, I mean, motor vehicles ignore traffic <coughs> rules too, but bicycles do it all the time. And you wonder whether had they been forced to go through a, an education program, you know, whether they would understand that they're supposed to stop for a red light. And maybe they just don't know it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I'm worried that with 18-year-olds, uh, no, not 16. Someone said 16. No, it's 18. It's 18. It's 18. Um, with 18 year olds, you know, have have they gotten a license? Have they taken education courses around the rules of the road? And do they know? Because again, you know, they can click through really quickly and say, oh yeah, 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 and they don't really know. So um, I'm just wondering whether that should be some sort of requirement that they have to have a valid driver's license. Um, I know that this topic has been discussed a lot at the state level with the other municipalities. It's an equity issue, at least from my perspective. Um, a lot of people I know that would use these devices don't have driver's licenses because they often come from other countries or they didn't grow up in an environment where they had access to a vehicle. Most people who are using transit, and I consider this a form of transit, don't have access to a vehicle. So to require a license is, to me, a, a huge burden. Um, I get what you're saying, um, and I'm not opposed to instruction and education and um, public awareness cam campaigns. I think that it would breed better overall behavior. Um, but if we don't require it right now for bicyclists, then... Well, I perhaps they should, but yes, but that's well, another policy. But, and that discussion. doesn't mean, you know, that my concern is you have to start somewhere, and that doesn't mean we shouldn't start with, with these devices, uh, where we have companies who are providing uh, these. And uh, with transit, I mean, you know, you get on a train or you get on a bus, and the fact is that somebody else is doing the driving. You don't have the responsibility here. The person who's got the scooter has the responsibility. And so that, to me, means that that person should be educated in terms of the rules of the road and what they should and shouldn't be doing. And I don't think an app about a oh, sign here if you've read all these things, you know. I mean, um, you know, we all agree to a lot of things when, you know, we're purchasing something. If you agree with these, you know, 42 terms, sign here, we all just sign because we're not going to bother reading the 42 things. Mm -hmm. This is important. Mm -hmm. It's different. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Scott Mullen. I'm actually from one of the companies. I work with Lime. I'm the director of expansion for the Northeast. Okay. And uh, I live out by Alewife. And I didn't ride a scooter here tonight, unfortunately. Um, what I'm hearing in this room is, is everything I've heard in dozens and dozens of rooms before, right? This is something that a lot of cities have done that you can learn from. Um, uh, I can say right now Providence, Rhode Island has a scooter pilot, 150 scooters is operating right now, and we plan to throughout the winter. I heard comments about inclement weather. Absolutely, we can turn the system off, not deploy that morning if there's going to be uh, snow or nor'easter, which happened a week after we launched in October. So we can uh, restrict access to these vehicles. We can make sure that they're out in a responsible way. The one thing that makes me smile, and I'm from here, I know all about the potholes. I've been riding a bike here for more years than I want to admit. Um, everybody thinks they have a sort of uh, uh, monopoly on potholes and bad roads. We launched 200 scooters on Labor Day weekend in Detroit, Michigan. And before the middle of December, we had 100,000 trips. Uh, I'm not joking. This is going straight up. Um, these things, you, have you ever seen Detroit roads? They definitely know a thing or two about potholes. Um, so I get it. The concerns are valid. Uh, what I'm saying is our company alone has had more than 20 million trips on these types of vehicles just in 2018. Um, this, this is uh, um, really amazing stuff. And I don't think 
And I'm hearing a lot about the year of the scooter. 2018 was the year of the scooter. I never thought those words would even be in the same sentence in that order uh, in 2017. But this is where we are. Uh, what we've seen is a lot of uh, people who won't go on our bikes. We have bicycles, electric bikes, and electric scooters. Um, they will get on a scooter. So this captures someone who may have else otherwise been in a car, right? Uh, and so we're, we're, we're really excited to uh, potentially take part in this pilot. Um, I can attest to the rigor of uh, uh, Director Crane. Uh, he's definitely going through, uh, <laughs> going through this with a fine-tooth comb and should. When we launched our scooters in the spring, we were one of two, maybe three companies. MEPC recently held a meeting and there were 19 respondents. And this is why the permit matters, getting the permit right matters because there's varying degrees of quality, there's varying degrees of experience. All sorts of things that you've already brought up tonight clearly are thinking through uh, and it really does matter. So um, I'm here as a resource. Um, uh, the director has my information. I can make it available to everybody. So if you need uh, any further questions, I, I don't want to take up too much time tonight unless there are any uh, immediate questions, uh, but consider me a resource moving forward. Yeah, do, do you have any information on the insurance issue that's been brought up? Do you have any? Yeah, so we do indemnify the city. We carry the, I think, 125 right, are, yeah. are our limits. Yeah. And, and how about the users of the. Uh, so if, if they. Does the insurance cover them? The, so if a user, you know, I would have to know the circumstances. Was there an accident? Was the user hit? Did the user hit someone? There, there's all sorts of stuff that can happen in there. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's I'd say a user hits someone who's injured and then wants to pursue some sort of legal action. Yeah, and they would go after that person that, that was riding our vehicle. Yeah. So it's do similar, you ensure so that that person has insurance? Because most 18-year-olds don't. Well, we don't require it. Think of it like Hubway, excuse me, Blue Bikes, rebranded to Blue Bikes. Um, if you're on that and, and you hit someone, it's on you. You're responsible for that person. It comes down to litigation. And wouldn't you be a party? Or couldn't you be a party? Uh, I, I don't know if we have been yet. I don't have any uh, um, examples of that. But, I mean, I'm assuming lawyers would make everybody a party, right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Any other? Yeah, I have yeah. one question. So at, according to this um, agreement, at the end of 120 days, it either terminates or becomes permanent. Um, and I guess there, seems that there should be some sort of middle ground there where we uh, do an assessment um, and um, you know, make sure this is how we want the program to operate instead of just, you know, at the end of 120 days, it goes into effect under new regulations. Yeah. I can work with Todd yeah, I'd, to, I'd work on that. to finesse that language. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Any, anything else? Anyone else wish to comment? Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're not, we're not going to be voting this tonight. Um, we have a little work to do on some language, um, so we'll come back and we've some questions have been raised by met board members and members of the public. So uh, we'll bring this back uh, when we're ready mm -hmm. in the next few weeks. Um, okay, yeah. We should just um, uh, remind people that we've got a new state representative today. So, oh, yeah. Um, right. Oh, is that today? Congratulations yes. to um, now Representative Patolo. And well, we have two new oh. state representatives. Right. Representing uh, Precinct 5 is uh, Nika Eligardo. True. Uh, so we congratulate uh, Nika also. Yeah. Um, yeah, and just t yeah, two of our two. four uh, reps have uh, turned over. Yes. So thank you to... Jeff Sanchez and to Frank Smizek for their service. So, right. Um, I should have announced it earlier, but it just occurred to me. Right. Well, we had a we have a bigger audience now. I know. <laughs> okay. I think uh, we're done for the evening. Thank you. <laughs>